Julie, thanks for joining us today. So you're the author of Making a Manager, which is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. You're also the former vice president of design at Facebook. And now you're kind of entering this third act of your career as an entrepreneur and a startup founder. So what are you up to these days? So I have been, uh, since I left Facebook, uh, I've done some consulting. I've started to really, you know, broaden my perspective and and uh, hang out with a lot of companies outside of social media. And one of the things that I learned through my time consulting with my partner, Chandra, is um, we got to see a wide scale of different companies and what they're dealing with. You know, all companies in every industry uh, working on hyper growth. And one of the things that we noticed that every company had in common is that they all want to be data informed. You know, we're at the stage now where, especially if you're building software, a lot of things can be logged and tracked. The problem is, you know, it's still a a human act to be able to make sense of that data. That was what we were being asked to do in a lot of our consulting, you know, to come into companies and to really help them understand their strategy, help them understand how to be data informed. And we thought to ourselves, why not just build a product that can scale that? Because we think that we can use technology, we can use different algorithms, you know, and so forth to be able to help us uh, both come up with uh, automated ways to do repetitive uh, insights and analysis that many companies need, as well as work on the storytelling element itself, right? Because data is only as useful as uh, how well people can uh, be able to take insight from it and then change their actions around it. And so a huge part of, I think, the job of a great data scientist is not just to know what's going on, but to be able to share it and tell that story. And so in essence, we're a data product, but more importantly than that, we're a data storytelling product, and that's what we're building. And the company is called Sundial, right? That's right. That's right. Yes. And it's called Sundial. And so you come from the design background and your co-founder comes from the data background, which it certainly sounds like that's informing the direction of your company. What was it that brought the two of you together at the very beginning? Like why data and design together? Our paths crossed because we were both at Facebook. And at the time, you know, I was leading design for Facebook and Chandra was leading data for the Facebook product and for Instagram and, and for a number of things over the years. We felt that we actually had so much in common when it came to our values about what it took to build great products. And at the end of the day, we think of ourselves most prim- predominantly as just builders. You know, the reason that we got into this game in the first place is because we wanted to see great products get built. Oftentimes, you know, we would have a room of people, right? We would have engineers, PMs, you know, designers and so forth. We're all looking at a bunch of metrics together. Chandra's great skill was that he would be able to come in and he would say, okay, guys, we're looking at this all wrong. You know, this is how we should be thinking about the story. And he would then just tell you a narrative. And it was always so simple and so clear that afterwards we would all be nodding our heads. We'd be like, yes, uh uh-huh, absolutely. And so now let's actually turn the conversation towards what we should do instead. A lot of what data helps you do is it helps you diagnose what's truly important. Um, And we have a saying, you know, in our, our company, you diagnose with data and you treat with design. Once you understand the phenomena, you understand the problems, you understand the opportunities and what matters the most, then you can focus on, okay, now how do I solve for that? I love that idea of diagnosing with data and solving with design. So will designers be able to use sundials so they can help prioritize their work and be less intimidated when they go into those data meetings? Our vision is that sundial can be a product that is incorporated into the workflow of everybody who builds products. Again, which I'm thinking of as engineers, researchers, data scientists, designers, um, even marketers, right? Because all of all of those disciplines are coming together to build something that can be valuable for people. I think of us a little bit too as, as um, doing for maybe data and product teams what Figma did for design. You know, Figma, of course, is used by designers to create design work, but they have done an incredible job of making it so easy for designers to then share that work out to people who are non-designers. And I think that's done wonders for how we think about design and how we participate in design across product teams. And I think data needs to be the same way. So your design background has certainly informed the product that you're building. How is design informing how you're actually building a company when you kind of put your, your founder hat on? So I think about everything 
kind of as a design problem. And um, I thought about this too when I was managing and just trying to put together the ingredients that create the best environment for people to repeatedly do the best work so that they can repeatedly find the best solution to whatever problem comes up. And so everything from who you're bringing into your company or what is the recruiting process like that allows you to uh, find and uh and bring in the very best candidates to, you know, how do you people get onboarded into your company and start to contribute to how do you come together and solve problems? You know, all of those are decisions that have an impact on both everyone's happiness, everyone's effectiveness, everyone's uh, ability to, um, you know, get the best out of each other. And so that to me is just like a huge design problem. I think my passion for company building comes from seeing it through that lens. And and it's mm -hmm. been tremendous fun to be able to be in the founder seat and to really think through all of those problems. When you're thinking about designers, you know, you've, you've managed hundreds and worked with hundreds of designers over your career. Um, what are three traits that you're commonly seeing in designers that you just think that they turn into terrific leaders and, and great team members? Uh, I think curiosity. This probably isn't limited to just designers because, of course, there's you know curious um, data scientists and curious uh, uh, engineers. But but I actually think that that's such a critical skill because if you can come in and you can have this mentality of like I don't know what the solution might be, you know, and and for designers it's critical to be able to come into a problem and say, well, I don't always know what the user might want. Let me go and and um, talk to a bunch of users. Let me observe what they're doing. You know, let me um, uh, make sure that I, I uh, deeply can get into their heads and empathize with them. It kind of can see every situation as like a fresh, okay, like what do I need to learn? How, which people do I need to meet? How can I, again, truly understand uh, what they go through? Um, and to kind of keep that optimism, I guess, that open-mindedness mm -hmm. and that optimism. I think that's that's hugely important for design as well as you know many other of the disciplines. I think a second one that is really important is uh, I think a, a sense of uh, maybe trust in the process and ability to take risks and, and try things that are a little bit new. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, I think every, there's always this pressure. Everybody wants uh, as as much as we want everything in our lives to, to feel like they can be controlled, right? To be able to say, hey, if I work on this for one week, I will be able to have a solution at the end of it. And I think that sometimes the best design or the best work doesn't happen if, you know, you always constrain yourself in that kind of time frame, right? Sometimes, you know, the work is great when it's great. I think that designers who have that trust in the process and who have a lot of steps to, to in there, to, in their toolkit to, um, help themselves have the best chance of getting to that great solution. You know, those are the people who more likely are able to then, um, you know, arrive at that destination sooner and more predictably. Any advice for designers who need the PMs and engineers around them to also trust in the process? What I always try and tell them is just to try and invite them into the process. You know, at the very beginning, just explain this is how we work or this is how you end up getting to the best work and to help them understand that, yeah, th that, that um, you know, the very first idea that you kind of come up with, it may be a okay, but it may not be the best idea. And we shouldn't always just accept it just because, you know, a mock is done that that's like, yep, like that's done. Check the box, help them understand. Okay. We can't always know exactly when we'll get to something great, but we can say that we'll probably need a couple rounds of, of feedback. Right. And so there'll be, mo you know, so in two, in two days, we may not have the perfect solution, but we'll have something. We don't know exactly how many um, how many of these iterations it might it might take to get there, but we can be more predictable about exactly what is the next step or the ne next milestone that we're working mm -hmm. towards. And I think that so helps as long people. as each step you're making some progress and everybody's yes. on board with that. Yeah. Thinking even a little bit more deeper about the role of design in startups in particular. So at GV, we meet with all these entrepreneurs. And I love when I get an entrepreneur on the line who's like, I am ready to hire my first designer. And then we have to walk through how they're actually going to do it. It's competitive right now. You want to find the right traits of a designer who's going to be passionate and help you build that product. Do you have any tips for entrepreneurs? I mean, you're probably going through this right now. Um, CEOs, they're going to hire their first designer. What should they do? I think the most important thing is to build uh, a product that uh, speaks to a care for design. And what I mean by uh, speaks to a care for design mean, 
it, it means that you're very, very people focused. You're very, very customer or user focused, right? I think if you come into it with a mentality of, we really, really, really care about having a great experience and all of the you know, or we're willing to go deep there. That's often the most attractive thing to a designer because designers want to be able to come in and know that their work will be valued and that, you know, ultimately um, we're going to do this because we want to make customers happy and we want them to to uh, love it. I think the second thing that matters is founders who really um, understand and can value what a designer brings to the table. So, if you only want a designer because you think that they're working on a, you know, they, they can help you with this very isolated, narrow problem, it's going to be harder to then attract people who want to do the full gamut and who have much more to offer. Uh, I think yeah. the third thing that um, that also helps founders uh, be able to attract great designers is um, being able to really have a vision for their product that seems big, that seems challenging, and that seems bold. I learned this actually um, through some of our time at Facebook, where I thought that uh, earlier on, the way that you were going to attract great candidates is to talk about how awesome your product is. You know, we have so many users. We've like, you know, we've we've um, uh, we have all these awesome features X Y Z, and and in fact, uh, that tends to just make people feel like you don't have any interesting problems to solve because you've already solved everything. Like, look at us, like we have so many great things or we have like, you know, I can show you all the stuff that we did, right? Oftentimes, great designers would actually tell me that that was like not at all an interesting pitch because they would say, "Where, where's the challenge? You know, where's yeah, where the, the yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, you yeah. know, where's the opportunity? Because if you already, you know, you guys are already patting ourselves on the back and you have all this figured out, then you don't really need me. Yeah, I love that that insight. I think you know, I talk to founders and they think, "Well, I need great design to attract great designers," and it's like totally counterintuitive. It's like, no, you have to align on philosophy and then give them the opportunity to bring, you know, design power to the company. So I, I love that, that insight. So on the other side, we also talk to designers sometimes who are thinking about taking, it's a pretty big leap to jump into a company as the very first designer. Um, do you have any advice for who des- for designers who are either thinking about making that leap or have taken that leap and they're now in that chair and they're the very first and, and only designer at a, at a young startup? The types of people who for whom it tends to be a great fit are the ones who have a curiosity about, you know, how um, how different components come together in order to make something work, right? So, I think if a designer comes to me and says, you know, I'm at the phase in my career where I'm really focused on learning a lot about the craft of design, you know, and um, kind of getting deeper, you know, getting better at interaction design, getting better at visuals or whatever it is, then. Oftentimes, I might say, okay, you know, maybe a, a, a larger uh, design team is a better structure for you, right? Because you will be able to have mentorship, you'll be able to have um, systems in place, you know, processes and so forth, and that can help you deepen your your skills in the specific craft of design. Uh, but if you have a designer who comes in and says, well, you know, um, like maybe I've done, I mean, I've gone through that, and now I feel like I'm, you know, there's always, of course, more we can learn with a craft. But I'm at the point where I'm actually much more curious and interested in how design comes together with lots of other disciplines to be able to make a great product. Um, and you know, I have maybe a lot of, um, of uh, uh, you know, I have a clarity for myself of fundamentals in place around design process and you know how to uh, how to bring that into another company. Then they might be in a great position to be that first designer. To continue on this line, like I sometimes feel conflicted. If I meet with somebody who it's going to be their very first job out of school and they want to go be the first designer at a company. And on one hand, I'm like, oh, that's so exciting. You're, you're just to what you're saying. They're excited about the mission. They're excited about the opportunity, that idea to be in on the ground floor of something. But on the other hand, I think, God, you're not going to have those support systems. You may not get the mentorship or the guidance that you would have if you were on a larger team. And I often think maybe it's better a little bit later in your career to join as the first designer. Do you have any opinions on that? I think a lot of times when people are in that situation, it's because they're... um, it's because they know uh, their. Fr- it's like the the company was founded by a bunch of other people that they know. So you know, you imagine yeah. there's a group of friends. They just graduated college. They're now all starting a company together, right? And and all of them are in that same position. And I actually think that in that context, it, it might you know, it's like sure, like you know, you're yeah, young. I agree. Founding you're, team. I would, yeah. yeah. I like you're you're taking there. a risk yeah. to the you know together. Go and do it, right? And you guys yeah. will learn along the way. And I think that's it's totally uh, it's fine. And and I always encourage that. I think if there is a 
a situation in which, you know, let's say there's a founding team already and they're quite established and, you know, um, it, it doesn't work as well if your goal is, like I mentioned, to try and um, improve your craft of design because it's just, you're not really get, have that environment where, you know, un, unless the company also tells you that they are, um, you know, searching, they're, they're also in the process of hiring a senior designer, right? That's actually oftentimes my advice for founders as well, that um, if you're going to bring in one designer, can you consider hiring two uh, yeah. because it's it's just so much easier for a, a designer to also have a partner right and you know the the two could be they don't have to be necessarily at the same level of experience like in fact i think it works very well for one person to be um more of have more experience be a lead you know have kind of done the tour at, at maybe other companies and have had that experience to be able to share and then the second designer can be you know somebody who's just fresh out of school or um you know very early in their career and that actually tends to work very well because then you do have a bit of that mentorship structure and you also have, you know, people mm -hmm. who can give feedback easily to each other. Um, uh, but if you're just going to hire only one, I generally advise founders to, to look for somebody with a bit more experience. Going back to this idea of being early in their career, a lot of people may not know that you're actually, your first job at Facebook was that it's an engineering uh, intern. And then, you know, you made your way over to design all the way up the ladder to VP of design. What was that early transition like um, and, and how did you enable that? Do you have any advice for anybody who's thinking about a similar transition? This was probably a little bit less like uh, fully intentional. Uh, what happened is that Facebook at the time, you know, designers were also uh, the front end engineers, you know, they were designing, but yeah. they were kind of also writing code. And so for me going in as an engineer, you know, I was asked on my very first day, what kind of engineering do you want to do? And I said, well, the front end, because I want to see, I want to do the parts that people get to see and touch and interact with. And that was kind of how I got assured to sit with the design team. And, um, and, and so it was a, a more seamless transition because again, they were all engineers too. Uh -huh. um, and we were just able to, you know, I it was almost like I was writing in code, but then over time I started to design. Nowadays, um, you know, especially in mobile or in other disciplines where there's uh, kind of a, a stronger barrier between design and engineering. I know actually many uh, engineers or front-end engineers or PMs, you know, who, um, who their transition to design is that they uh, just loved that aspect of it. You know, they love thinking about what people, uh, you know, uh, were experiencing and how to make it better. And so they would just participate a, a ton in things like design critique. And oftentimes it can be quite natural to just start to participate in those activities and, and see how you feel and, and see how, you know, the team responds. And then little by little, you know, you do enough of that and you can say, okay, actually, this is I would actually like to do this much more, you know, for, for my, my yeah. role. And so everyone I know who's yeah. kind of done that transition successfully, it's not just like they decided in a vacuum. It's like they were already taking the steps to be able to, um, you know, do more of the, the activities that designers do. You and I got to work together for about five years at Facebook. And we saw, I mean, when we started the design team, kind of sat in a hallway, I want to say. It was a very small area. And, you know, I remember us celebrating, you know, a couple hundred million users. We saw Facebook go from a few buildings in Palo Alto to serving billions of people around the globe. And that high growth um, of the product and of the company, it changes your job, you know, pretty rapidly over the years. Do you have any advice for designers right now who are finding themselves in that exciting phase of like, oh my gosh, everything's changing, everything's scaling, it's getting bigger. Um, you know, my job is changing. Do you have any advice for designers that are finding themselves at these, uh, you know, wildly scaling companies? Uh, I think that's a really, really great point to bring up because I was very lucky that I had you uh, and I had, you know, a wonderfully supportive manager who I could talk to uh, about these changes and who had, you know, you've had, you came in with that experience, you know, you'd, you'd been at other companies, you'd scaled, you'd seen that scale. And so therefore you were able to, I think, share that with us and, and present, you know, a little bit of a, a what's to come and what should we prepare for. And I think that is, uh, you know, incredibly valuable and, and insightful. But I think a lot of, you know, what I and, and many of my peers, as you recall, um, I'd gone through these questions around like, well, should I be a manager? Should I be yeah. an IC designer? You know, um, and and what are the differences in those pathways, right? Because I you know when your your company is scaling, there are opportunities for leaders to kind of come in and we need more managers. And in fact, many companies like it when the managers can be homegrown, you know, because these are people yeah. who have that experience and have the relationships and the, there's so therefore you might be presented with the opportunity. The question is, 
should you take it? You know, is that the right path for you? And advice I'd give to folks who find themselves in that that position are like, go out and just talk to people. You know, there's many folks who have either gone through that at other companies or who have, um, you know, seen that type of scale. And if you don't see them at your company, um, then maybe, you know, step out and, and, and see if there's folks who might talk to you about uh, the scale that you're seeing who have had those experiences at other places. I don't think there's any job where it's 100% all the time. We're doing everything that we love. But but certainly, if you are the type of profile that really loves to understand a problem and go deep on it and have the space and time to think about it, then maybe individual contributor path will be a better path for you. And if you're the kind of personality that cares more about what the outcome is and you're willing to do lots of things, you know, and that almost like matters less what you do in order to get to that outcome. And it's more important that you just, you know, arrive at that outcome, then maybe you'll find a lot of uh, satisfaction and joy from, from the management path. I also think it's okay for people to eventually come to the conclusion that they like a certain phase of a company's growth, right? It's Mm -hmm. okay to say, look, well, I've had those experiences. And what I really love is the very, very early stage of a company. You know, maybe it's like uh, 10 people, maybe it's like 50 people. And when it gets to larger than that, then, you know, and there's maybe more communication overhead, you know, that's just less exciting to me. And it's okay, right? We know of designers who have done been very successful in those, in those phases, and they know that about themselves and they can at the right time be able to then go to the next uh, company. And over time, you know, it's like you go through the journey enough times, you learn these things about yourself and, um, and that can help you, you know, uh, be able to do more and more of those things that you love. And we're lucky to be at this time now where so many companies are embracing design, where if you're a designer, you really can find a company at almost any stage that will be willing to embrace you and bring your talents onto the team. So something you've mentioned, you know, we're talking a lot about trying on new roles. You're trying on this new hat as founder and entrepreneur. Designers are taking on new responsibilities. Um, Something you've mentioned in past interviews uh, is imposter syndrome. Maybe you faced it. I know I faced it sometimes. We all do. Do you have any advice for someone who's facing that right now? The best advice that I've ever received and that I continue to give people is that just know that you are not alone. By doing so, you know, we make it more normal, right? It's not like, oh my gosh, I'm the only one. Because what imposter syndrome feels like is everyone else has their stuff together. Everyone else knows what they're talking about. Everyone else is confident. They belong. And you're the only one. When you hear actually everyone feels that way right at some point in their career you know even the people that you think are coming and and seeing and seeming so confident and so you know put together and so of course they should be here like they probably feel that about you too and so there's so much power in being able to say look i am struggling or i'm not sure what to do or this problem that i was just handed is overwhelming to me and i don't know where to get started and to ask somebody else for help. I discovered this actually quite late in my career. um, But when I did it, you know, when I I kind of felt that I had reached this really low point after I came back from uh, maternity leave, after I had my first Mm. baby, and and I was really struggling. And I was in that very, um, you know, imposter syndrome place where I had been gone for four months. And I came back and everything was going quite well. And I think because I was not very confident as a new mother, that just you know, that, that lack of confidence went into every aspect of, of my uh, life. And instead of being excited and happy that my team had done, you know, very well without me and they were thriving, I took it as a sign that maybe, you know, I wasn't adding any value and that I didn't belong and that I, you know, maybe didn't, it shouldn't even come back. And when I was able to finally admit it to my manager, I was able to actually, you know, reach out to a lot of other uh, women who had gone through, you know, the the new baby experience, and and to even sit down and, and get a coach to help me. What I heard was like, "Hey, I'm not the only one who's felt that way." And in fact, you know, I'm being too hard on myself, and it was going to be okay. And you know, just give my, you know, it was almost like permission to. Um, be able to feel those things and to go through that challenge. And so now whenever I struggle, you know, my first instinct, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of trained it is like, okay, I am struggling. Who can I talk to who can help me, you know, who've maybe gone through that. And and I would just say to them like, Hey, this is what I'm going through. And it's really hard for me. And like, would you, you know, chat with me? Would you give me some advice or would you connect me to somebody else that might be able to help me through that? And it is just so powerful. Bringing that language of vulnerability to leadership and, and to companies, it's just, it's such a powerful tool. I think when you can be vulnerable with other people, 
then they see you as human. It sounds really yeah. counterintuitive because I think we're we're taught to, you know, growing up that we should admire all of those people who seem invincible, like the the supermen and the superwomen, right? Who have everything together. But it actually is hard to feel truly connected to those people. When a leader can then actually say, you know what, I'm I'm not perfect too. Here's all the stuff that I'm struggling with. And you it actually creates a much tighter bond, you know, um, between people, right? Because honestly, yeah. no, none of us are perfect. None of us yeah. have it figured out every day all the time. Yeah. 